Keith Smith, Yahoo Sports, joins us every Wednesday on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. As a little midweek NBA talk, never hurt anybody. You got the Sixers and the Magic tonight. And, uh, of course, that brings no Joel Embiid. You got uh, Markel Fultz facing his former team. Keith, welcome back, man. What's going on? Hey, just excited for this game down here in Orlando tonight. It'll be good to see this matchup. Wish Embiid was going, but completely understand why he's not. Uh, yeah, the load management stuff. I guess we could start kind of with that. It's been yeah. a big co- topic of conversation. And does the NBA have a load management problem? Is this something that uh, they are keeping an eye open at? Yeah, they're definitely keeping an eye on it. We we saw that with the Clippers situation. They obviously want guys healthy. If it's an injury situation, the league is never going to put a, put themselves in a place to say, hey, that guy should be playing, even though he's hurt. But they – also came down famously a couple of years ago where they said, look, we just don't want guys just randomly sitting out games, and especially in these national TV games. I think they tried to make the players understand as well, hey, you make a lot of your money because of the TV contract. Let's be smart about this because if the networks start noticing guys aren't playing, they're not going to pay and those kind of things. So, you know, I don't know that it's a major issue. I think you want to be cautious of it, keep an eye on it, but – The folks who were saying, you know, back in my day, these guys never rested. I have a little bit of an issue with that. I I grew up in the NBA in the 80s and the 90s. And for me, everybody wants to bring those clips out. Kevin McHale clotheslining, Kurt Rambis, and things like that. And say, that's how it was. Well, that was one play. It wasn't like all game long was like that. It's a different game and we're smarter about the way guys take care of themselves. We want to have them healthy for the whole run of the season as well as a good long career. Yeah, well, it seems that a lot of guys are utilizing this opportunity to kind of sit out. And, I mean, the league is, you know, last week they fined the Clippers 50000 bucks, which doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot of money in the grand scheme of things of the league. But uh, I don't know that there's a way they can go about it to fix it. But uh, we do know that a lot of these players are, you know, welcoming this opportunity. In fact, uh, there was a player recently, who was it, uh, that just came out? Corey Maggette, was it, that said, if they would have load managed me, I probably would have had a longer career. Yeah, and that's exactly how a lot of the players feel about it. They they look at it almost akin to in Major League Baseball. Guys would regularly throw 150 pitches in a game. You didn't think anything of it, and they'd go out and do it again five days later or four days later, and that's not smart either. We don't let that happen anymore. And, and the, the reality is in basketball, it, once you're into the meat of the season, you're pretty much playing every other day. That these guys are the off days are not really off days because there's travel involved and all these other things. So I think what the players look at is, hey, we want to do what we can to be healthy. And as Kawhi Leonard put it, I want to be there at the end of the season when these games really matter in the playoffs. And if you do it deep enough roster, then take advantage of it. Same thing Philadelphia, a big chunk of the, the, the appeal to signing Al Horford was he can be the guy in there in the middle on those nights when Joel can beat the break and you're not running the entire uh, backup lineup out there because you're able to just slide a guy over, and all of a sudden you're probably not really downgrading all that much. Keith Smith, Yahoo NBA, and of course, uh, now Embiid played last night. He's out tonight. Horford did not play last night. He will play tonight. However, what has been your overview of this full Sixers team? Have they uh, kind of disappointed? Are you looking at – because i got to tell you, Keith, they beat the Cavs last night, but it was an ugly, sloppy game, a lot of turnovers, and we're right back to the conversation of, ah, oh, the coach, the coach, the coach. And I'm not one of those knuckleheads, so don't want me in with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to yell at you too much. I think it's, you know, one of the things that you always have to look with the coach is that he was he involved in building the roster, and if he wasn't involved, well, then he's going to coach the roster the way it was. I really feel the same way I feel about this team now that I did at the beginning of the season. They're going to be great defensively, and they are. They are going to have moments offensively where they look really, really bad because they just don't know about the floor space thing. And It's really tough when your two main three-point shooters in your lineup are Al Horford and Tobias Harris because even though they're, they're both good shooters, they're good shooters for their positions. They're not the kind of guys that defenses are going to really bend themselves to take away. That's something that they really lost when they lost to Jay Reddick. Even when Reddick was off his game on those rare nights that he wasn't hitting shots, the defense bends towards wherever he was on the floor. You would see the defense kind of always you know, shade his way, make sure he 
and lost those screens where now they get wide open, those kind of things. They just don't have that guy right now on the roster, and that's making it really hard on the rest of the guys to create anything. And obviously the concern with Ben Simmons remains, is he not is he going to make jump shots, is he ever even going to take jump shots? Because even taking them would start to loosen things up a little bit. Keith, one thing that I've had my eye on early on through 10 games for the 76ers is one Embiid's endurance and insert the load management conversation we just had. But number two, his ability to field double teams and make the right basketball decision late in games, especially when the opposing team decides to double, whether it's passing out, spinning out and making a quick, decisive move. I haven't seen that yet. Like in Denver, I believe he had seven turnovers in the fourth quarter or the second half. And he just doesn't look like that's an area where he's improved. How does he improve that area quickly? That's not really something that can be taught by the head coach. Yeah, it's something you, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of practice time in their their season, especially with a guy like Embiid. You're not going to go out there and push him over the heart in practice when you don't even let him play back-to-back games. So never mind getting him out there and saying, hey, let's have a good hard practice here. So I think one of the things you have to do is you have to work with him pregame when you can, and then you, know, you can get out of it there and work a little bit on some of those skills as far as reading where the doubles are coming from. So long as it just takes time, unfortunately, part of it is lineup construction. If, they, if teams can double freely off Ben Simmons when he's out around the arc or there right now, there's even Josh Richardson, or they're even willing to leave Harrison Horford because – They'd rather take the chances with those guys shooting open than they would indeed getting a layup. That's going to make it hard on him as well. It's it's really tough. And the endurance issue, fortunately, I think that's just got to be kind of you're going to say that's who this guy is now. When he, when he's out there and looks good, it's going to be fine. But you do worry that that, that it was the Denver game. He just looked awful at the end of the game because he looked, you could tell he was completely and totally wiped out. And I just don't know how that improves now because, again, this is a guy who's not going to be able to push it over the park when he's on his off days and playing to get that condition up. I think it just is what it is at this point. The turnovers, just to rewind a little bit there, you know, we had a good conversation about this, not only this year, but last year and the year before. And that's the trend with Brett Brown coach teams. It just feels like they're always at the top of that list for leading teams in the NBA with turnovers. And I look at their style of play and the style of play that the Sixers have, their identity that they're building right now, it doesn't dictate to have that amount of turnovers almost night in, night out. And I don't know how much blame you put on Simmons there and what you've seen from him, but his lack of aggressiveness as a scorer and then silly mistakes as a passer really has a lot of Sixers fans scratching their head, Keith. Yeah, what's really tough, too, is they don't play at a really fast pace either. So if you're playing at a fast pace and they're coughing it up 15 to 20 times a game, it's still not ideal, but you can say, hey, it's a fast-paced game. we got a ton of possession. I mean, when you're kind of getting these rock fights and you're just throwing possessions away, that's really hard because you're just that's never going to work out well for you. So I think part of the challenge, again, it comes back to when they get into the half-court offense, it just everything looks so condensed and small for them because they don't have anybody who's who's stepping out there. The other thing is what I noticed this season, which I don't know if it's a conscious change or just the way the offense is kind of going, they're spacing a lot more towards the corners and along the baseline, which that's just a very easy cover for NBA defenses. Almost anybody can get out to those corners. That's why it's their favorite shot in the NBA when it's open. They, they're not getting those open, and that's where they're kind of spacing to versus above the break you know, up around the top of the key where that creates a lot more spacing. It's just something's going to have to give at some point. I, I'm starting to wonder if this group is just – there's this isn't a mix. It may be sometimes you have to take a step back a little bit of what looks like a step back talent-wise to get better fitting pieces, and then that brings a little bit more out of everybody. It's way too early to say that this year because, again, they're fine. They're, they're going to be a good team. But you have to wonder if that, by the time we get to the trade deadline, if they're still kind of just scuffling along here a little bit, you have to look at it and say, what can we reasonably change? 
Yeah, it's interesting because I've kind of said, Keith, that I mean the regular season for me is tough now. I mean the Sixers are kind of who they are. We know they're going to make the playoffs. They're probably going to be at least a second-round team. And if they don't get out of that second round, I think big changes end up coming. And you wonder if those changes include, well, number one, the coach, I would imagine, would be on that list. But the whole Simmons and B dynamic, like uh, whether somebody, Elton Brand, decides – we gave this group four or five tries at the three, literally three tries at it, I guess, to say four or five. And they're so young, it's hard to say they can't do it, but it will something kind of say, look, maybe these two guys are just a little clunky together. Yeah, and, that, and you, you said it right. You don't usually get a whole lot of years in the NBA to figure out if something works or not. We, we all love the Spurs that they stuck with things forever, but that's just not how it really works. It's usually you get two, three, four shots at it, and if it's not working, something changes. A lot of times the first time around, it's the coach. It's the coach is going to go. And then after that, it starts to be, all right, well, I guess it wasn't the coach. And then you start looking at, at the players. And we're Brett Brown, I don't want to say he's been on the hot seat, but it's been discussed in the past. We all know that. So that starts to be, all right, well, that's already kind of out there you know, with that. And then I think you need to look at it, and as you said, is the Simmons and the pairing ever going to get us to where we want to be? And even if you believe they could – now you're looking at building a roster, though, around the two of them when they're both on max contracts. Harris is on functionally a max contract. Harris or Horford's on a big contract. Richardson's on a big contract, but still, you know, a good sized contract. And what you may have to say is, well, we love Simmons and Embiid together, but with the other guys we have on the roster, it's not possible to build this out. And maybe what you do is you do one of those, hey, we can get three good players for Embiid or two good players for Simmons. And that's the kind of move you make again as you kind of build out the entirety of the roster versus just having the real top heavy start at five. Uh, Keith Smith, Yahoo NBA, with us here uh, as the Sixers play the Magic tonight. And Ben Simmons, I got to, you know, wonder if people around the league are looking at Simmons and thinking, this is it. This is who this guy is. This is the best he's ever going to be. And if this is good enough. Yeah, there was a lot of hope coming in that, hey, well, he took, took all those jump shots and those offseason videos. Maybe that'll come to light. And now we're a month into the season and hasn't even attempted one. So that's become a little bit of a. Well, I guess this is, he's never going to do it because if not now, when the early season is usually when you see guys breaking out those new moves or those new shots or whatever the case is. And that's not to say he's a bad player because he's far from a bad player. He's a really good player. He's a unique player. In a lot of ways, whether your point guard is six foot two and can't shoot or he's six foot ten and can't shoot, you're going to have a hard time building an offense around that because of. It just makes it so much harder on the other four guys when the point guard is not threat to do anything outside of the paint. When you look at the rotation for the Sixers this year, one thing that is a positive, there's a lot of positives, but the depth on this team. You look at Kyle O'Quinn, and he's a third viable option in the front court. You look at Mike Scott, James Ennis, Furkan has come on and has almost been equal to J.J. Redick as crazy as that sounds, but what do you think the ideal rotation is for this team? How is Brett Brown going to figure out the first three off the bench, you know, for the postseason run? Yeah, I think you hit on it. I think it's going to have to be those those guys there. I think there's a good chance that they're, that's not what it ends up being. I think Elton Brand will be aggressive in trying to find a trade somewhere if he can that'll upgrade at least a couple of those spots. But as the roster is built right now, that's exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be, you know, Scott, Ennis, O'Quinn, Korkmaz. I, I like what Raul Neto has given them recently. I think he's looked pretty good in that backup spot. Now, the problem with him is he, he's just a guy who can't stay healthy. Uh, throughout an entire season, so that always becomes a little bit of a problem. So, so what you're looking at doing is, is you're you're really trying to spot those guys in with no less than two of the starters on a night where everybody's available, because you don't want to ever go into uh, big stretches of games or big big um, stretches of minutes in games where you are playing that entire five some together as a group, because that's just not really going to work. But if you're putting any two of those guys in with any three of the starters, you're probably looking pretty good. Uh, interested to get your take on Fultz uh, tonight. Now, he has kind of said that, uh, you know, it's all business, no grudge, but there's definitely going to be an edge 
uh, to the game. This is who I am. This is, uh, you know, uh, basically he says, I'm not out there. There's no grudge. I'm trying to win. I'm doing whatever I can to win. I know last week you had said that they're very happy uh, with where he is. Uh, I, I, I've watched a lot of them. Um, numerically, I thought he'd be a little better, but co- in confidence, like in terms of his confidence, does he look like a growing player that is more comfortable and that is ready to kind of maybe take that next step? Or is he kind of like stuck in the middle there? What, what do you see when you kind of eye test tell you with where he is? Yeah, he really does look more confident with the ball in his hands. He is uh, playing with an edge comment is something he said a few different times, so that's not just unique to this matchup. One of the things that's uh, nice to see is he says that, and then he does go up and play this attacking style where he loves to get into the paint. But the Magic aren't all that different from Philadelphia. Everything is so constricted and tight for them because they, they just they can't make a jump shot to save their lives to start this season. So that's making it really hard on Fultz. A couple of games where they shot the ball well and the floor started to open up, you can really see this kid's ability to break down a defense, get in the paint, make plays, whether it be for himself or finishes, or to be um, find a shooter or find a cutter, those kind of things. But when it's not going well, that's when – you see him kind of – he's almost invisible out there. He's not doing a whole heck of a lot because he's not going to take jump shots. He, he's, he'll take one or two a game, but they don't usually look all that great. They've got to be really wide open because of how slow the lead is and where he's the ball from and those kind of things. So that's when it comes a little hard. That's when Steve Clifford leans on D.J. Augustin instead to get in there and play those minutes because he's just a far more accomplished player as a shooter. That helps the offense a little bit. But the Magic's offense has been really tough right now because, again, just everything is so tight for them in and around the paint. Anybody who's, I mean, anytime we get one of these teams, I mean, it's going to be an 85 to 80 game. We end up with 120 to 115 every game. But I, I, my guess would be really that younger if you're looking to do that tonight because this looks like it'll probably be a rock fight. Yeah, it's it's uh, interesting because you know you mentioned the shot, and, and I guess you watch him. Uh, you know, you're down there in Orlando. You get to see a little bit more of him. Like, uh, if he's still hesitant with that shot, he'll only take it essentially if he's, which is a little bit further along than Simmons is. By the way, if he's wide, wide open, uh, we have seen Fultz at least attempt the shots. He's not shooting at a very high clip, but does the shot just look still a little broken? The shot doesn't look broken anymore. He doesn't have that crazy hesitation in there. He's not doing anything that looks like really goofy form-wise. It's just, it's a low shot. It's a set shot. He's not shooting jump shots uh, out of the perimeter at all. Where it actually looks pretty good is when he goes into fadeaways and turnarounds. Yeah. That's when it looks like it's very quick. There are times, Keith, when he fluidly does like a turnaround or a fadeaway or when he takes you to the basket and then does a step back that he looks like the guy you took number one. You're like, yeah. whoa. It's like only off the dribble, though. Yeah, but he wasn't like yeah. that last year. No. No, yeah, that, that's the time when you see it. It is it, almost quick plays where it's almost like, like there's no thought process that goes into it. I'm just playing ball. It's when he gets it out on the perimeter and you even see times where the defender almost runs away from him because it's like, I'm go ahead, <laughs> shoot it because – one thing that defenders learned real quick, and I think they knew, but but it usually shown it is if you press up on this kid, he's going right by you because he's so fast. He's so good with the ball in his hands that if you press up on him, they're going. And that's going to be a problem as we get deeper into the season. Teams see them for a second, third, fourth time, or even in the playoffs if the Magic get there. Teams are then going to say, hey, just play a mile off this kid. Either he's going to figure it out and beat us from it, and we'll say, hey, good enough on you, where they're just going to keep dropping off him and it's going to really make a mess of things for Orlando. A uh, couple quick notes with Keith uh, here as uh, Boston, 8-1. and one. They've won eight in a row since losing to the Sixers on opening night. Now, I was one of the people who liked Boston making the trade out of Kyrie. I loved Campbell Walker and thought that they would still be really good, uh, but they're better than I thought. They're going to lose Hayward for a little bit here, but what's going on? Why has Boston been clicking? Everything fits on and off the court. Everybody's happier. There's not as many miles to feed, so that's made the pecking order a lot easier to to define. And one of the things I've been saying this since July, in a vacuum, Kyrie Irving is a better player than Kemper Walker. But fit matters. Walker can do things off the ball that Irving can't or won't do. When Kyrie's off the ball, he try, kind of turns into a statue. Kemp is always moving. He's trying to get open. That's making it easier on his teammates. There was a play at the end of their game the other night 
where he really worked a uh, two-man screen game with Daniel Tice away from the ball that got him a wide-open three, which kind of locked up the game and clinched for the Celtics, and that's just something big. Then the other thing is they're defending their tails off. They're getting after everybody defensively. Marcus Smart has been, for my money, the best defensive player in the NBA so far, whether he's defending seven foot three Chris Saps Polzingis or, you know, six foot ten power forwards or, you know, other guards like he defended Luka Doncic the other night. He's just been phenomenal. Uh, yep, and uh, they've been pretty good. We'll see them. The Heat... Jimmy Bucket, seven and three. He looked pretty good. I, you know, it's another team. I watched them twice in a row and said, "Man, this team uh, I think is going to be top three seed in the East right now." You got Boston Heat, Bucks, Phillies, four. But I like that uh, Heat. I said between three and five. Uh, I really like what I see athletically from them. Yeah, if you like defensive basketball, they're another team that just gets after. And they, then another team that already this early in the season, they kind of know who they are. They know what their pecking order is. They they know what they're going to do. They, their backup lineups are very good, uh, partially because they're playing a couple guys in Kendrick Nunn and Duncan Robinson in the starting five that most people didn't even have as rotation players. So that's got guys like Kelly Olynyk and Goran Dragic, who a lot of people thought might start coming off the bench, and that's really allowed them. When their bench comes in, they don't see really any drop-off. They're playing really, really good basketball down there in Miami. All right, uh, Keith Smith, we do a little NBA each and every week here as we are uh, 10% or so through the first uh, part of the season. Uh, by the way, Atlanta, too, is another team. They killed me last night in the parlay, man. They go on the me road too. and beat Denver. <laughs> uh, but Trey Young, man, he has been outstanding. A lot of people uh, were wrong about him. Uh, but nobody was wrong about the Knicks or the Wizards. That's uh, I think we can all <laughs> safely say that. Keith, always a pleasure, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Keith Smith, Thanks, like man. all guests, appear via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.